So good morning, everyone. Um, I am excited to be here. I am even more excited that I just remembered to take myself off mute and Rebecca gave me that reminder because I think we can all relate to in this Zoom virtual world of presentations that we have all had an experience where we're talking and then nobody can hear what we're saying. So this morning, I'm gonna talk about, you know, what we are seeing from the behavioral health perspective, what youth are saying, and then how we're talking about that. Um, in recent years, we've seen an uptick in adolescents needing treatment for vaping. Um, we see kids who are as young as 11 to 12, which is kind of crazy um, to think about, you know, middle school students coming in and needing treatment um, for various substances, but including um, vaping as well. And, um, you know, it's really unfortunate because I've had middle school students present with addiction so severe that they needed nicotine patches to get through their day. But the most common ages that we're seeing are between um, 14 and 16. So as a clinician and a supervisor, I encourage clinicians, behavioral health specialists, parents, or anybody that's wanting to have conversations about with you to be specific about how we're asking about vaping. Some people really don't associate vaping with tobacco or nicotine and youth don't always see vaping as smoking. So how we ask is very important. It's really interesting to me because many of the younger adolescents and youth that I see don't relate to smoking because of the, the flavors and it's not like traditional smoking in their opinion. I had an experience where I had a 10 year old that was vaping and he reported you no know, nicotine use when we were assessing and asking about his use because he said he didn't smoke stinky cigarettes like his grandfather. Um, I also had a 14 year old girl who said um, vaping was not the same as smoking because it didn't make you ugly or give you those holes in your throat. So these are examples of like what we already know that the work that we do to educate our youth is very necessary and relevant. Um, how fast youth get addicted varies. It's, it's just from different individual, different individuals. Some are reporting becoming addicted even without everyday use. So the idea that kids have to be vaping constantly to become addicted to vaping is not true. It just varies from person to person. And most adolescents that we're seeing don't know that they are addicted right away and they don't recognize it until they're in a full-blown addiction. Um, they usually start recognizing they have a problem when they can't go with, you know, without using, or they start having some physiological symptoms such as chest plant pains, difficulty breathing. And we see this particularly being true with athletes. So we get, referrals from athletic directors sometimes who um, want kids to be seen so they, we, they can address these issues. But I think the interesting part for me is that they're often unsure of what vaping does to their brains. They, can, they know about the body and sometimes they know that it can affect the lungs if they have that information, but they're not really sure and they're not always seeing what it does to brain development and how addiction is a brain disease and how the brain changes during addiction. Adolescents also don't always realize that addiction in the developing brain has the potential to set up pathways for addiction to other substances. So we often talk to adolescents about how vaping can flip that switch because we know that there's a genetic component to addiction. And when they try a substance for the first time, if they have that genetic component, it can kind of flip that switch and make them susceptible to um, other addictions in the future. In terms of trends, what we're seeing, most are reporting that they start as a result of peer pressure. They're often asked to try and then they buy one on their own and they just continue that use. And I think it's important for us to remember, again, as behavioral health specialists, as preventionists, as parents, as concerned people you know, in the community, we have to remember that peer pressure is no longer just from the kids in the hallway or those whispering in the corner in the bathroom. Um, you know, social media, and media plays a big role. And we're not always aware of how much this influences thoughts and behaviors from adolescents. So when I see adolescents, I'm in treatment, we talk a lot about peer pressure, what it means to fit in, what it means to not fit in. We're also talking about what makes them feel good about vaping and why. You know, so when an adolescent tells me that they're, or youth, when they tell me that they're vaping and they can't stop or they really want to quit or they're having a hard time. I, talk, I encourage them to talk about what they like about it. Vaping gives good feelings, you know, whether it's physical or social, by the way, of just being a part of, you know, a group or a social scene. 
it feels good. And even if it's temporary, that's important to you. And so in terms of parents, parents' reactions vary. And it's very interesting um, what we see in the behavioral health field. We see parents that come in in a panic and they're like, oh my God, my kid's vaping. What do I do? I need to do something. And then we have parents who are really nonchalant and some that don't really care. Um, one of the things that I talk about frequently is that we get parents who will actually ask you know, um, school administrators um, for vapes back. So when they're confiscated in the school setting, we have parents that will tell administrators, hey, I need to get my kids vape back because I paid money for that and you can't keep it. And it's really because they're not educated as well. So we talk about parent education about vaping being very important and encouraging parent participation in all stages. So whether it's prevention, intervention and treatment, we want to encourage parent participation in all of that. One of the biggest questions I think I get asked as a behavioral health specialist is what do I do if I find vaping devices or like if I think my kid is vaping? And so we talk about asking questions, being open, don't accuse, listen and discuss. Um, and that's what you want to do. You want to ask them questions and be open to what they're hearing. I always talk about the Colombo method, and I'm not really sure if anybody really remembers Colombo. Um, I used to watch a lot of TV with my grandmother, and I really like Colombo. I never really understood why he always wore raincoat, but that's neither here nor there. But the Colombo <laughs> method, he was a detective, and he always had this unique way of asking questions. He always gave people the benefit of the doubt and then asked for clarifying questions. So if you find a vaping device in your, you know, in your kid's room, or again, you know, if you're an administrator or just a concerned person and you have a person that you think is vaping or you see something that's a little bit off, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt and ask those clarifying questions. You know, one of the ways to do that is to say, hey, I noticed a pod in your room the other day. What do you know about it? Um, and that immediately kind of eases the situation and allows you know, the kid to have a response. It also gives the parent some time or, you know, the person that's addressing them some time to kind of look for the nonverbal cues of their response. So when you say, I noticed a pot in your room the other day, what do you know about that? If they kind of get that deer in the headlight look and they're like, uh, 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 you know, it's kind of telling of some things. So, but it's also not accusatory because it could be that they're holding it for somebody and we want to be mindful of those things. So give the benefit of the doubt, ask the clarifying questions. And once they begin to answer, you really want to listen. Listen to what they have to say and then be open to discussion, just open to discussion about it. So when it's possible, um, when you're talking about like why they're vaping and if they're vaping, you know, you want to make sure you're talking with them and not at them. This is something that we talk about in the vape talk. You want to be open and remember what it feels like to be under that enormous amount of peer pressure, what it feels like to want to fit in. And even if you can't relate to that feeling in terms of a substance, I think we've all had an experience where, you know, there were the cool kids in the corner or something, you know, maybe they had like the, the cool haircut or cute jeans and we want it to kind of be like them. So kind of take, taking ourselves back to that point and remembering what that feels like. And, you know, when possible, relating the quit talk, you know, or, or the intervention part of it, relating that to goals and how vaping might impede those. So I've had a really, a couple of funny experiences, you know, when we talk with athletes, I often will tell them, hey, you know what, you can't, it's hard to run if you can't breathe. Like, so, you know, we got to talk about this vaping thing because you can't really do what you're setting out to do if you can't breathe very well. I had another client and it was pretty hilarious. She, um, we were talking about her goals and different things. And she had mentioned earlier in the assessment that she was vaping pretty heavily. And so she told me that she wanted to be a missionary and share the gospel. That was her goal. And I was like, that is pretty amazing. I said, but you know what? You can't do very well, cough and speak, you know? So if you continue to vape and you're coughing, it's going to be really hard for people to kind of hear your message. And so we joked about it and laughed, but it was relatable for her. And so we talked about, you know, more about the dangers of vaping. So any way that we can engage youth in the discussion and making it relatable, relating ourselves, sharing pieces of ourselves when appropriate, and, you know, um, again, just being open and mindful of those things. That is the, that's the key to having those great conversations. So again, you know, as a behavioral health specialist, we're looking at 
the treatment side of things as a prevention person. Um, we're also looking at the prevention of that. So we want to just make sure that we're doing everything that we can the best way that we can and engaging them as best as possible. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over.